Hi, I'm Ria, and today on Spectrum, it's time to pay a bit more attention to ourselves. From our stomach and counting our calories, to our ears and the sounds we hear. Yes, we'll be listening to the Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response, or ASMR. And on Let's Talk, a national athlete tells us about the sacrifices she had to make doing what she loved doing. But first, let's talk about the food we eat. Residents staying in hall don't really have the luxury of enjoying home-cooked food because they often eat at their hall canteens. In this day and age, is it still possible to whip up a home-cooked meal, especially if you live away from home? Home cooking has in recent years been on a decline trend in Singapore. Many Singaporeans are finding it difficult to find the time amidst their hectic lifestyle to cook at home and are choosing to eat outside instead. This is especially so in the universities where most students stay on campus in hostel rooms. Here, we speak to some students from the Nanyang Technological University about their eating habits. I cook at home but I don't cook in hostel. No, I don't cook. Generally, I don't cook like legit food in hall. I always think there's not enough time. Ingredients-wise, it's very, it's very hard to store ingredients. The preparation and the cleaning up, it's like, yeah, I don't want to go through that, so I'd rather just take away or like just order food. Difficult, inconvenient, lack of time. These are just some of the complaints that NTU students have about cooking in hall. But how does eating outside on a regular basis actually affect our bodies? Outside food, huh? Uh, can be summed up in the following terms. Like I think it's first too salty, too sweet, too oily, too meaty. Eating out can be linked to the following diseases, obesity, diabetes, cancer, hypertension, high cholesterol. But for 21-year-old Jing Rong, cooking in hall is a part of his daily routine. To him, cooking is his lifelong passion and something that began at a very young age. It was just preparing for lunch essentially. I was hungry one day and so uh, I went to fry up some eggs. Yeah, it it <laughs> didn't really turn out that well. Over time, you know, you learn the ins and outs, the very basics of cooking and you realise it's not all that difficult. It's not all that difficult to, to make something edible. But it is a bit more difficult to make something that is good, that is tasty, that is delicious. So, that came later on, lah, when I realised that cooking was my thing. It was what sort of defines me. Uh, I, I put all my photos of my food up on Instagram, but uh, I, I've been taking photos of my cooking since day one, actually. It is more of a way to remind myself and to document my own journey as I get better and better at uh, cooking. This is the question I, I would say I get the most often, actually, from people who, when they first find out I cook. It's like, where do you find the time? I will definitely cook breakfast every single day, Monday to Friday. My breakfast, I would say most of the time, they're kept uh, under 15 minutes. If they want to get started cooking in the hall, is to really figure out how to do it as quickly as possible. Maybe now's not the time to work so much on different styles of cooking or polishing your skills up, mm -hmm. but, but rather just getting down a workflow that can get you from start to finish in under 20 minutes, that would be pretty acceptable. Pre-preparing, uh, ingredients like condiments and things like that like uh, it can be as simple as just bringing ingredients from home that you wouldn't otherwise be able to find in the hall relative to what I would eat if I didn't cook for myself I would say my diet can be said to be much healthier than than uh, eating outside because like the misiam I had the other day was super oily there was a layer of oil on top of the misiam like two millimeters thick it was, it was quite uh, crazy actually to see that I because of this I have started cooking more uh, healthily la. Yeah, so I, I think cooking healthy is not the only way to get fit. You have to, you have to combine both uh, cooking healthier food and actually exercising. And in this sense, they work hand in hand because exercising makes you feel guilty about cooking more unhealthy food.
we went down to the NTU campus and interviewed a few students to let them try out Jing Rou's cooking and find out what they think. If I told you that actually this was prepared in the pantry of this hall. Oh really? By one person oh. under 15 minutes. What the? Okay, I'm quite shocked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really expect it. I thought it was probably from like a canteen or something. The food is actually pretty good and uh, yeah, it, it actually shows that yeah, you can actually cook legit food in the pantry. I wouldn't expect something uh, that tasty to be prepared in such a short amount of time. Now. Does this change any of your perception about home cooking? Well, I think it definitely inspires me since uh, since, uh, since someone can do it, then um, why not me? Uh, I, as in, yeah, so maybe I'll be inspired to cook something else besides Maggie Me one day and maybe let my friends try. He's like showing us that it can be done and like of a certain standard. Like I realised that actually home cooking can take a much shorter time if preparation and planning is done. Yeah, and I will definitely be more willing to try. So my advice to people who want to try their hand at cooking is simply to really get started and to start simple. Some initiatives are not, all, are not, not at all difficult to, to, eat, to get started, to initiate. You really just have to take that first step. It's hard work to be healthy, but what about athletes who compete at a national level? Gymnasts train rigorously for months, even years, for routines that only last a few minutes. Kai Feng finds out more. Today, we have 19-year-old Michelle Teo, who trained as a national gymnast for 10 years and has represented the nation in the 28th SEA Games and the ASEAN School Games. Hi, Michelle. Thank you for taking time to be with us here in the studio today. Thank you for your time. Can you please share with us how you got started in gymnastics? So, um, at around age four, so as a child, I was always a very active child. So my parents, actually one of my parents' friend, daughter was in gymnastics. So she actually introduced my parents to gymnastics and so I started from there, yeah. Wow, so you've been doing gymnastics since you were age four and you just recently ended? Yeah, so I actually like retired when I was about 16 plus, um, nearly 17. I see, so that was a good like 12, 13 years of, of uh, doing gymnastics training and, and going to school at the same time. How did you balance that? Okay, so last time when I was training, I used to train for six days a week and um, five hours each day. So I stay at school on top of that. So definitely in between training, on the, um, after school on the way to training, I would have to um, eat my meals in the car and then do a bit of homework before training, yeah. This must have been a really large sacrifice for you in terms of time, commitment, and even your social life. Do you feel like you've missed out on life as you were doing all these uh, gymnastics training? Um, actually, it's kind of true because I've always been either in the gym or in, the sc or in school. So it's always like my friends would be like, hey, you want to go out after school? You want to go eat lunch or something? But I've always had to say no because I always had training after that. So definitely my social life was affected. But yeah. So you talked about your social life and you talk about like academics. Uh, this mustn't have been easy for your family as well. Having to make sure that you get to your training on time and for your parents to make sure that they're keeping, uh, that you're keeping on top of your work. And can you explain, uh, can you share with us how that was for your family? So um, for me, I'm very lucky because my parents are actually very supportive of both my gymnastics career and my school life. So they always try their best to help me as much as they can. So um, most of the time after school, um, my dad tries to um, pick me up and fetch me to um, my training place. But sometimes if he can't make it then, because I have other friends that are also training together with me and, and they're also from the same school. So our parents actually um, try working together. So we try to um, help each other out. Uh. So my parents have been very supportive from, yeah, Talking about all this um, sacrifice, uh, would you still say that overall it, gymnastics has, has a positive impact in your life? Uh, yeah, definitely. So um, I've done gymnastics for the majority of my life and it has definitely 
I've definitely gained a lot of values from it, like simple things like time management, time management and discipline. So all these things really help me. Um, so really helped me in my life, like juggling with school and gymnastics, as you said just now. So it really taught me a lot about like life in general. Yeah. I see. So do the positives extend to like competitions? Can you please tell me how? What was the best moment you've had in your gymnastics career? So um, for me personally, the best mo moment would be representing Singapore for the 28 Sea Games, where my team and I actually clinched the silver medal. So actually, like just a few, a couple of months before Sea Games, um, quite a number of us were actually injured. So it really took a lot of hard work and sacrifice for us to be able to compete well, and um, we managed to do Singapore proud. Yeah. So you guys actually got the silver medal at the 2015 uh, Sea Games, and that is a monumental achievement. Can you describe how that felt like, knowing that you had brought back a medal for your country? The 28 Sea Games was held in Singapore itself, so being in Singapore, it, was, it felt a lot nicer. My family members could be there, my friends could be there. So for me, my team and I, it was definitely an honour to represent Singapore. And for us, we definitely did our best. And it was, really, it was really a great experience standing on the podium and just seeing the Singapore flag. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that experience that maybe only 50 people in the entire country can, can experience. Uh, and so now, being an athlete in the national sports system, uh, what would you say, uh, what would you say everyday Singaporeans could do to better support our athletes? If they see us around, they can show us just um, a bit of support here and there. They don't necessarily have to be there during our competitions to watch us because they might have something on. So it's, it's really just the uh, encouragement that we get from Singaporeans that really keep us going. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time, Michelle. And we're really privileged to have you here with us in the studio today. So stay tuned as after the break, Michelle will show us some of what she's learned from her 12 years of being a gymnast. So Michelle, we've prepared some mats for you, so please take it away. That was a 10 out of 10 performance. Thank you so much for spending time with us here in the studio, sharing about your journey as a national athlete and showing us some of the things that you've learned throughout your 12 years in your gymnastics career. Ever heard of the term ASMR? It's a trend that has gotten more popular in Singapore. Even celebrities like Cara Delevingne and Xia Xue started showing interest in it. ASMR is supposed to stimulate tingles in our body, and the sounds will leave us feeling relaxed. Here's one example. Welcome to the world of ASMR. ASMR stands for Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response and it is the experience of a tingling, almost ticklish sensation down the back of your neck or the top of your head. It is when what you see and what you hear feels so real, it tricks your brain into thinking you are actually physically there. My name is Elizabeth and I'm a year two English Lit student in NTU. Previously I was from NP Mass Communication and actually it was there in, when I was year two that I discovered ASMR. I guess I was about 17 or 18 then. Yeah, so I've been listening to it for about two to three years. It just makes you feel very relaxed and puts your mind in the right condition to fall asleep. Personally, the ASMR that I prefer to listen to is tapping sounds or scratching sounds so they just pick up random objects and then they scratch them or they tap them close to the mic and they roll around the mic so you get a very 3D effect. Actually I had problems sleeping because I suppose I was a bit stressed out in school like it's always thinking about the next project you have to do or the next deadline so when I plug on my earphones and maybe I'll just scroll to an ASMR video and I'll play it just you just feel calmer after you hear the sound effects or after you watch the visuals it feels like your body is relaxing and 
also there's this sensation that that's commonly used and it's called tingles. So when you listen to the sound effects or when you watch it, you're supposed to have that feeling and it's, um, I was saying that it's like when you're a kid and your friends trace your back and you get that tingly feeling, it's the same feeling, yeah. Tingles are not created by any physical form of touch on your skin or whatsoever. If you see um, one of the ASMR artists attempting to brush your face, you think you feel uh, someone is actually touching your skin. This happens because um, the activation of the, the visual neurons so is already inter interconnected with the skin receptors. I'm a Leo. This phenomenon like is becoming more common beach. here in Singapore and has a small uh, but growing community. I like to Most of them turn to ASMR to relax France. and unwind, while oh, others have gone on further to create their own ASMR content. Playing with slime is very distressing, but for a lot of people, I think slime is a toy. You know, you people play just because they find it fun. Like, it's the same thing as play doh, really, for children. Yeah, people like to touch things, to have that kind of sensory feeling, and especially with slime, not only does it feel good to your fingers, it also sounds good. When you press into it, you will have like a crackling sound. It's the same sound as popping bubble, uh, bubble wrap, that kind of satis- you, know, you, know, you can't explain it how satisfying it is to pop bubble wrap, but people still do it. Yeah, that's the kind of sound that I think it just makes, you don't even know why you like it, but you do. This is something, it's very easy to make and I think that people would pay money for this and so I thought like since I'm spending so much money on it already, I might as well make something out of my hobby and so that's why I decided to start selling on Carousel. One of my favourite artists is this girl and her YouTube name is Goodnight Moon ASMR. She creates very very realistic scenario so it's a lot of VFX work and thinking of very creative, very out of the box ideas like you go to a tavern and you just sit there and order drinks or shop for dragon's eggs, I don't know, things like that, yeah. The post-production work she does is very very impressive. It's far beyond the level of a regular YouTube vlog or regular tapping or scratching. I do agree that ASMR is not a very inverted commas cool thing to do and uh, a lot of people still have the misconception or the that that is very that is weird you know to listen to people whispering but I think uh, I see a lot of uh, uh, news outlets they are covering more on slime and ASMR and that kind of thing so I think people are starting to become more interested in it if you were to ask me if I would like take it as my career I think that is going to be a no because as you know, slime's, uh, slime's a trend and trends come and go. There's such thing called like ASMR immunity where after exposing to like the stimulus for a long period of time, right, you no longer get responses and because your, body's, your body has been adapted to it. I mean, there are a lot of research um, stating that your body can get adapted to the environment um, if like the incumbent stimulus is incongruent to what you feel. The videos themselves. ASMR seems to be one of the most intriguing new trends happening here in Singapore, and given its recent surge in popularity, it could even develop into something more than just a hobby. But as trends come and go, whether or not ASMR is here to stay remains a question to be answered. In the meantime, have fun with ASMR, but just be careful not to go overboard, or you might just lose the tingles. This is Barnabas Chua reporting for Spectrum. So now that we know ASMR is a thing, we've got Kai Feng on the streets to see what people actually think of it. Thanks Ria, I'm at the Weekend Wee Ventures and I have with me a couple of tubs of slime and a couple of our Weekend Wee, fellow Weekend Wee schoolmates. So can you tell me, have you heard about ASMR? Yes, yes I have. Uh, so what is ASMR? Auto. Meridian response. <laughs> that's quite a good choice. Uh, that's quite a good attempt. It's actually the auto sensory meridian response. 
and it it's talk, it refers to the tingly sensation you feel when you hear certain sounds and uh, even when you touch certain objects. And so today, in light of week 11, we brought you two tubs of slime to try and help you relax. So could you please take the slime out and play with it? Take it out and play with it. Take it out, take it out. Take it out. Take it out. No, yeah. How is, this so, how is this supposed to be relaxing? It's just a bit weird, a little bit like... Mm. ASMR! Well, thank you for being our lab rats and joining us here out at the benches at the Wee King Wee Studio to experience a bit of ASMR. Thanks, Kai Feng. And I shall leave you with all those good-to-feel tingles. Be sure to stay tuned for more exciting news and views. And you can always follow us on Facebook, at NTU eSpectrum for insider information about your favourite tutors. Until then, I'm Rhea. Goodbye. <laughs>